What's up, everyone? Welcome to On The Market. This is Dave, your host. Join with everyone today. Jamil, James, Kathy, Henry, everyone, how are you? Good. I answer for everyone, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. So happy to be together. All right, Jamil, are you and Henry recording from the same place? He's actually just in the other room. No, we're both in Phoenix, Arizona. He's at Hot Bobby's studio, which, as you can see by the sign, is mediocre at best. Um, <laughs> mine, on the other hand, is not. Bobby, who, how would you describe Bobby, Jamil? Hot. What is his job, though? His job is videographer and... Um, Motivational speaker. <laughs> okay. He, right, he pep talks it. me. He's like, it's okay. It's okay. Yes, you are built like a bag of milk, but people like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I need a Bobby in my life. That would be nice. Did you say built like a bag of milk? <laughs> somebody actually said that to me on a live stream last week, and I was what? stumped. I'm like, somebody said, hey, Jamil, congratulations on the weight loss. You're looking great. And then somebody else was like, what are you talking about? He's built like a bag of milk. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> wow. I, I haven't heard that one before. Oh, Jeez. Wow. Uh, that's a first. I think you're looking great, man. <laughs> I actually went, I tracked down a bag of milk very soon after that, and I was poking it, and I'm like, man, <laughs> what? At least 2%. <laughs> Such a mean thing to say. I'm, I'm saving that one. <laughs> I think you're looking great. They're, well, they're, they're straight up wrong. But everybody loves milk, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, we both don't. No, nobody actually right. likes milk. <laughs> now that we lost our farming sponsors, cheese. I, I can get on board with cheese. Um, <laughs> all right. Well. Bobby nailed the Henry Washington purple for anyone who's not watching it. He did Somehow that just for me. He's got your perfect hue going yeah. on. All right. Well, for today's show, we're going to do our correspondence show, which if you listen to this uh, podcast regularly, you know it's our format where each of the cast members brings a article that they found interesting and pertinent to the real estate investing community. But today we're focusing it a little bit on opportunities in unique markets. So each panelist is going to bring a story about a unique place in the country that has some sort of potential for real estate investors. Before we get into that, Kaylin has teed up a pretty hard game for us. I don't know how you guys are going to do on this. It is a history game. So I'm going to ask you all questions about the history of the housing market. And I want to see how well you guys understand this. The first question I'm going to direct at James because he looks <laughs> the most nervous. The question is, <laughs> when was the first mortgage issued in the United States? I have not the slightest clue. All right. Give me a century. What century do you think it is? I'm going 1900s. Okay. it's a good, good guess. And I'm going to go with 1918. Okay. Final answer. All right. 1918. World War One. Okay. Kathy. 1776. Because I just feel like Whoa. people. Yeah, I'm just going there. Alexander Hamilton. They just came out the gate. Declaration of Independence. Mortgages. Next thing. And then a banker was like, dude, I can so take advantage of the situation. Yes. That actually sounds right. Okay. <laughs> Henry, what do you got? Uh, 1802. Ooh, okay. For absolutely no reason. It's <laughs> a good number. Jamil? Well, I've looked at a lot of houses, and I've seen a ton of construction in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and my opinion would be that you'd see more construction as affordability or mortgages became available to people because they need to borrow money. So I'm going to say 1890. 1890 is similar to what I was going to guess. Uh, what was you? I just think like maybe it was like a post-Civil War reconstruction effort to stimulate the economy. I'm going to go 1872. Okay. Uh, and let's see what we got. Kaylin on the big board. Whoa. Okay. Kathy, pretty f***ing close. <laughs> 1781 was the first wow. ever mortgage issued. God, there's bankers always. Yeah, what took him so long? <laughs> so you're telling me that the Republic is interwoven with credit? Yeah. It's <laughs> r remarkable. To think about, Jamil. Wow. Can't believe it. <laughs> All right. Second question. In what year did the U.S. federal government start selling off land? Henry. Uh, 1802. 18 <laughs> 
I like it. He's just, he's just going to keep, Kathy, you started this on the very first episode. We started guessing. You just said seven and a half for everything. <laughs> and now wrong. Henry's just going to say 1802 for everything. All right, Jamil. Well, I think we probably needed to start selling stuff pretty soon after, after the formation. So my, my guess is going to be 1790. Okay. I like 90 for some reason. James? I, I'm, I'm with Jamil. I'm going 1777. They started trading dirt right out the gate. Think of how much potential there was to sell dirt back then. It was just an open canvas. Oh, that was a wholesaler's dream. <laughs> Except there'd be no comps. There'd be no comps. <laughs> I could just make up, hey, that's just like today. People just making up ARV, right? That's like, hey, you buy this, who knows? It might, White House over here could be worth a lot one day. <laughs> if someone buys it, you've just established value. So yeah. Kathy, what's your guess? Well, since you said I like sevens, then we'll go with 1777. Why not? All right. I'm not going to guess because I just saw the answer. But Henry, his strategy is working. It was 1802. No, it was 1800. Wow. It, was, oh, wow. it was 1800, but extremely close. All right. Last question. When was the lowest annual mortgage rate ever recorded in the United States? Jamel. 2020. Henry, don't say 1802. <laughs> 1801. Okay. Push it your luck. All right, Kathy. Can I tie with Jamil? 2020. All right. James? April of 2019. Okay. Pre-pandemic, huh? It was in 2021. Oh. Oh. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back after the break. <laughs> <laughs> after these messages we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with our correspondence show welcome back everyone for our correspondence show today we're going to be talking about unique opportunities and situations in given markets across the u.s that we think that you as investors should know about so look i brought a story that i thought was super cool right so affordable housing is a problem all across the country you also have the problem of impoverished communities feeling like they don't have access to home ownership and i uh, am privileged to have met this developer who did this project and i thought what a cool opportunity to be able to share this because um i feel like this is a you know this is a play that can be run in in many larger cities and uh, an opportunity that other developers across the country could take advantage of so there is a black developer by the name of booker t washington who built a 29 home micro home community. So these are larger than tiny homes. They're going to be between 330 feet and 630 square feet. So larger than tiny homes. So 29 micro homes in College Park uh, uh, in the Atlanta area. And so this is a predominantly black neighborhood where uh, a lot of working class individuals live and there's not a lot of access to affordable housing, nonetheless, home ownership. And what they were able to do by building these micro homes was to build, and they're really nice, modern looking homes that they built. And what they did was they were able to build these homes and then build them at an affordable price. So the purchase price for these homes were between 200000 and 230000 And if you look at the average home price in Atlanta, it's around 400000 So you're getting a house for essentially half the price, albeit it's a little smaller, but it's still a home. So you're getting a house for about half the price, which puts your mortgage somewhere between thirteen and 1700 So call it $1,500 for a mortgage, which is less than rent in a lot of places in Atlanta. And so people now had opportunity to own homes in their community. They didn't have to leave their community to find something nice. They didn't have to leave their community to spend their money somewhere else. They could keep the money in the community. They could keep their jobs in their community. And what I thought was really cool about this was the land that they built this community on was vacant, abandoned land. It wasn't producing any tax revenue for the city. And so 
they were able to take land that wasn't producing anything for the city. And now that land is producing tax income. The houses are providing affordable homes. It's a nice community. People don't have to leave their community. And it was also a profitable venture for the developer. And so I feel like that's a win all the way around. I think we talk a lot about affordable housing as a problem. And really that problem just means what? It, problems mean opportunities. It, when I was in the corporate world, they didn't let us say the word problem. They made us say the word opportunity instead of the word problem, because it, every problem is just an opportunity to solve something. And so I think this was a creative way to create affordable housing and keep people in a community rather than feeling like people have to be forced out. That's awesome. Wow. Very cool story. So do, is it the public-private partnership that allowed that property to be built at such a low cost? You know, I'm I'm not sure. Now he's a seasoned developer. He's been he's been, you know, building other communities before. And so I'm I'm sure he's got uh, I'm sure the build cost wasn't anything different than what he's normally building, but the size of the house is also smaller than uh, a typically normal house. So you're not spending as much on the build either. Was this the first time this this guy did a development like it? I believe it's the first and only black developed micro home community in the country. Wow, cool. Well, hopefully with all the success, it will be a sort of a blueprint for for future opportunities. That is what I hope as well. All right, great. Well, thank you for sharing that story. Super cool. All right, James, what story do you have? Uh, mine, uh, it's a it, it's similar to Henry's. I pulled an article that talks about uh, the amount of money that's being spent to develop um, homeless shelters in Sacramento. Sacramento has allocated over fifty to sixty million dollars to develop anywhere between two and three hundred affordable housing, not really affordable housing, more for for shelter for living, where they're going to provide food services, and this is all based around uh, fixing the homeless situation. And the reason I found it so interesting is, A, there's there's opportunities that come with that. We currently own a, a 68-unit rooming house in Capitol Hill in Washington. And because the demand in the city has been spending so much money on homelessness or also on just subsidizing people that need help, it what it's done for us on that specific building is it actually turned our building into like a 40% cash flow building because we were approached by the state and they offered us a ridiculously high rent to secure the building and they locked it up for a long period of time. So as an investor, you know, sometimes we look at this and we're like, okay, th that's not really good for the market, right? You're bringing in homeless shelters that in theory, you know, the, the New York Times reported that on average that drops your property values by 15 to 20%. Um, so it's definitely something you want to be aware of that's being planned in your neighborhood because it could reduce your value. But as a buy and hold investor, if you're buying multifamily in that area, they, at the end of the day, they don't have enough units. Like they're spending 50 to $60 million and it's it's only going to help about 5% of the total homeless. That's going to get about two to 300 people into housing. There's four to 5,000 that need housing in Sacramento alone. So it's it's barely moving the needle. And one thing I, I did want to point out, because I think Henry's article is really good because it shows working with the private sector and how they made something that works financially for everybody. But if you really break down the cost of what's being allocated right now, they're, they're developing two to 300 tiny houses. Those on average cost forty to $60,000 to create. They are spending two hundred to 300000 to put one every one of those units in. And this is completely inefficient. And if they could become efficient, they could help three times more people, if not more at that point. But it's always something as investors, you want to be paying attention to what's going on in your city, what's going on in your jurisdiction, because as stuff like this is happening in our major cities, it's happening in Seattle, it's happening in LA, Sacramento, across the nation, it's a need that is, it, it, it's a need that must happen, right? We have people living on the streets, they need to get in housing, they need to get help, but they need to do it in the right way. But as investors, you have to pay attention to this, because if you're looking at buying a single family rental property in that area, the value could go down. Now, if you're buying multifamily in there, start reaching out to states and you can actually get some state contracts that will actually help you substantially and it will save the state money at that point. You know, by them renting our our huge rooming house, they're paying a fraction of what they're spending in Sacramento on these housing to to house these people. 
And so the private sector, it actually makes more sense financially, like what Henry was just talking about, that the government works with the private sector because they actually can reduce the cost. And it's good for the private sector because you actually get paid a little bit higher return, too. So it's a win-win if they can put it all together. But it's definitely something as this homeless crisis across the United States is happening, you need to pay attention to what's being developed, where's the money being allocated, and what pivots do you need to make as you're putting together your portfolio. Yeah, it's super interesting. I hadn't really heard uh, some of those stats about property values and how they're impacted by this type of stuff. Uh, you know, you hear a lot about sort of about nimbyism, where it's like people don't want it in their backyard. So it's very, it's a really challenging problem to to try and correct because we do need housing and to be able to provide options and services to these people. But obviously, it, it seems like most people don't want the services provided anywhere near where they live. So it creates a really difficult situation for these governments. Yeah, we we got toasted on a house one time. It was in 2013-ish, around there. We bought this property, great craftsman home, great area of Seattle. And then after we closed, uh, we're waiting on permits. A sign goes up that there's a tiny house development going in across for homeless. And it was a year-long contract. Basically, they were doing these pop-up tiny homes around the city of Seattle for a while. Well, they used to do that in Denver, yeah. Yeah, and then what? Ha- that house became unsellable. Hmm. When we were done, not one person would buy that house. And this is back when pricing was a lot more affordable, too. And uh, we ended up having to keep that as a rental for two years because it just would not trade. Um, so you, you do want to pay attention as you're buying your investments. You know, I don't think it's bad to have rental property in the area, but if you're doing short term development flips, you want to be a little bit careful. You don't want that extra objection in your deal. Yeah. I mean, we've tried all kinds of things in California, right? And, uh, Malibu became, I don't know if you guys know this, but became a sanctuary city. And, um, over COVID, um, all of the beachfront parking, became homeless homes and they would park RVs and and their cars and LA passed a law saying that you could live in your car. And, you know, of course the, the people of Malibu actually wanted that. They, they want to find a solution for the homeless. What we discovered is that crime increased dramatically. Um, and there weren't really the services for people. There were no bathrooms. So, you know, it's just bad. Bottom line is a homeless problem is different than an affordability problem. To me, the homeless problem is more of an opioid uh, or mental health issue and just providing some housing isn't going to fix it. But I, I've talked about this before. No, or at least figure out how to provide housing that works for the masses. You, either these plans are half plans. They're not even half plans. They're they're tenth of a plan because they're just spending all the budget and then making minimal impact. And it's like you spend the budget, help the people, but make the impact. And that's the, and, and it really comes down to government ways, government spending. They don't know how to develop stuff. They don't know how to build things. I heard they were building ADUs for eight hundred grand in LA. Like what yeah. do like how do I get the contract for that? I will build those all day long. Yeah, you know, for us it costs us three hundred forty grand to build that. It's just it, the inefficiency and wasted dollars means no one's getting help. It's a it's a nice theory, but they need to put the right plan behind it. Just like everybody has to do for building out a business. If you want to build out a business or build out something that's going to be successful, you got to think it all the way through where I feel like it's just a splash drop in. And at the same time, it's going to affect people, right? Like if you own housing in that space, your property could be worth less. You might want to sell and, and reload out. You know, it's definitely something that has to be addressed, but they need to refine how they're doing it because it's not working. All right. Kathy, what is your opportunity that you've been looking at? We're going to go in a very, very different direction (laughs) from the first two. Um, I tend to love getting into areas before something big happens, but you kind of know it's coming. It can be a little bit risky because that big thing may actually never happen. But if it does, that's where you can um, really make a lot of money if you buy an old property in an area where, again, like something huge is coming in. So, you know, you all know that I love the Park City area. I love Utah. I think, you know, they're creating massive jobs there and a lot of the tech industry, they're calling it Silicon Slopes. What a lot of people don't know, and now the word is out as of this moment, uh, that right behind Deer Valley, they are building a brand new ski resort. It's called the Mayflower, Mayflower Mountain Resort. And for years, uh, they didn't think this thing was going to happen. So if you bought in the area and it didn't happen, then I don't know. Do you guys know where Heber Valley is? It's like not not a well-known area, unless you're a fan of Park City. So the houses out there have been fairly cheap. But when this ski resort gets built, it is going to be, just look at this. The Mayflower Mountain Resort will be 
North America's newest world-class alpine village to be developed since 1981. So to me, this is a huge deal in an area that's already growing. You know that Utah's growing. You know that Salt Lake is growing. And there's this new resort. Um, so th- if you wanted to invest in the resort, you're going to have to have some deep pockets. I, I imagine the homes are going to be in the millions for this if you want to be like ski and ski out. However, if you still want to buy one of the older homes nearby, I think there's a huge opportunity. Um, close by, there is a development where there's going to be a Tiger Woods golf course. And then where I'm investing is a brand new development um, that's not mine, but could be. They We may partner with these guys. But a friend of mine, um, actually, I, who I met through Ken McElroy, bought my dream. He bought a hot springs. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. He bought, like, how do you buy a hot springs? But he did it. And, uh, and he's going to have all these houses so you can go ski at the Mayflower, this brand new resort with all new equipment, all new cool stuff. And then go home and just like jump in the hot springs. So I love the idea. I think it's really cool. I think kind of you could go in anywhere in the area and make money. If you wanted to buy in this hot springs development, the way he's selling it is the way I've been talking about selling in our Park City development, which is the fractional shared vacation ownership, because one of the biggest wastes of property, and I see it all the time where I live, is rich people come in and buy vacation property and never use it. So you've got world-class property that sits empty, and it's awful. It's disgusting. But uh, if, if you're able to share it with several owners, so that's always being used, but how often are you going to use it if it's a vacation home? And in this case, it's six to eight weeks, which is more than most people vacation. And I think the buy-in for one of those four-bedroom homes, it's in the two or $3 million range is 300000 for your share. So it's it's not for everybody. It's it's not out of range for everybody, but it's also not in range for everybody, but it's cool. But again, you could buy an old house in the area and do very well. Well, James, what do you think? You're I probably like this. The, yep, exactly. He's the only one who could afford it. So I think... Uh... <laughs> well, I had the privilege of staying at Kathy's, one of Kathy's units or one of the units that they developed in, in Park City. And it's, it's an amazing place. There's so much growth there. And then what kind of blew me away was the amount of bodies that were on that mountain and in, in that city. <laughs> James is scarred by this experience. Oh, I turned around and left. We flew all the <laughs> way out there. I got there. I looked at the line. I'm like, no, nah, I don't do lines. Me either, buddy. But they, this is really neat. Did. And then, you know, and it was like this, you could hear the chaos in the ski lines. Like people are like, do we go to Deer Valley? They're like this quest to find a good mountain. And so, I mean, the demand's definitely there. And I mean, in, around that city, you could see how much in Park City was developed in the last 10, 20 years. And the fact that it's so close to that downtown city too, uh, it was a really cool experience, but I think it's really needed. Um, it's in high demand and it is definitely going to do what Kathy said, and that's bring property values up. Because that's where the money's going. Money is going to raise the values and amenities are going to raise the values um, along with this hot springs. Tiger, it seems like Tiger Woods is doing golf courses throughout the nation. He's just selling his name. I, I read on three articles with him on the golf course, but uh, it's going to bring money in and values will go up. Oh, I forgot to add. There's also Deepak Chopra in, in the development that I would be investing in, possibly partnering and syndicating. And uh, he, Deepak Chopra is going to create a wellness center there and wellness centers are really on the rise. Uh, people want to live longer. There's a huge generation of baby boomers who want to be healthy. And so there's just a, a lot of big names tied to the area. And again, that's that's always good for a rising real estate values. All right, cool. That's a good one. I like it. Jamil, what did you bring? Okay, so before I get a bunch of hate mail from people about this, I just want to say that I chose something really outside the box and it's it, it's about dark tourism and and the article that i brought and what i where i found it was they actually listed for sale john benet ramsey's home where she was you know found dead and again i'm it's terrible it's never a tourist attraction when something happens to a child however what i do want to say is dark tourism is alive and very 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 lucrative for people who are willing to invest in properties where gruesome crimes have happened. For whatever reason, we have an obsession as a nation to want to see these places. And so if you look up the Texas Chainsaw Massacre House, I mean, it's a massive draw. If you're ever in Los Angeles and you want to see the, um, what's that TV show that uh, Ryan Murphy does? American Horror Story House. Mm. The American Horror Story House, there's always people outside. There's always people wanting to get in. It's a huge draw. And so I'm thinking, you know, 
it's pretty well known that if something really gruesome happens in a house that it's hard to sell right away. So hear me out. So let's just say, for instance, you're tracking these gruesome crimes and you decide, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer like 30 cents on the dollar for these things. And I'm just going to hold on for a little while. Once the emotions settle, I can put it on Airbnb or something of like, like a cord, right? And, and possibly cash in. So um, today I think there's a unique opportunity in dark tourism. I want to button this by saying right now at that house is worth $8 million, almost $8 million. They're selling it for just over, um, just under 8 million bucks. And when it was, when the crimes happened and when it was sold, it was it sold in the 400,000s. Wow. So we're talking a massive appreciation from purchase. And it's way beyond the appreciation of the neighborhood. It's way beyond the appreciation of other homes in the area. And I believe the reason for it is because of the story attached. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Boulder is a very expensive market. I've I've driven by this house. It's in a very nice area in a very expensive market. But are you, are you saying people should buy it and then like turn it into a museum? Or you just think like someone else is going to buy it even for more because of the history to it? I think that you could monetize it by turning it into a museum, which again, look, the the ethics around that are questionable, but I mean, I I, th- I just think there's a fascination. I think there's an opportunity. Look, I I've driven down Bundy Drive before in hopes of being able to find the OJ house and learned that they demolished it, right? And so, I mean, why 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 would I even want to drive by? I'm not a weirdo or a sicko, but I was like, I'm on Bundy Drive. I think something really crazy happened there, and I googled it. I'm like, oh my god, OJ Simpson. Let's find the house. All right. Well, thank you all for bringing these stories. We greatly appreciate it. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you for the next episode of On the Market. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Research by Pooja Jindal. Copywriting by Nate Weintraub. And a very special thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.